Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's presentation on preliminary geological and structural observations from the August 9, 2020 Sparta, North Carolina earthquake. As you can see here from the first screen, uh, we have many speakers today talking about various details of these uh, interesting earthquake in North Carolina. Uh, and on behalf of the Professional Development Committee of ERI, I thank them all. Uh, some technical details. Uh, so today uh, we're going to use these um, go to webinar platform uh, and uh, your audio is going to be muted by your mic is going to be muted by default. Uh, and we ask you to keep your mic muted for the whole presentation. You can submit questions uh, in the questions panel on the right hand side menu you can see in your on your screen all questions uh, or at least uh, a big portion of them will be answered at the end of the presentation we hope to have time for uh, a long question answer session um, today's presentation is being recorded and we will be uh, posting the presentation uh, through ERI uh, channels. You'll receive an email about uh, these within a few weeks. So as you all know, uh, this webinar is organized by ERI, the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute, which is a nonprofit membership organization. Uh, it's pretty multidisciplinary uh, and it's, um, its goal is dedicated to advancing earthquake resilience in the United States and globally. We have many members ranging uh, from different uh, background and expertise, and we think this is one of the big strengths of ERI. Uh, this is a, a webinar offered by the Learning from Earthquakes LFE program, which is a flagship program of ERI been conducting earthquake reconnaissance since the uh, since 1948. Um, the program uh, has been funded since 1973 by the National Science Foundation. It has a pretty multidisciplinary focus, as you can see from today's presentation. We have uh, people from academia and practice uh, contributing to learning from earthquakes reconnaissance. There's a dedicated website, learningfromearthquakes.org. The first presenter today will be Arthur Mershat uh, from USGS, uh, and uh, Arthur is going to talk about regional geology and focal mechanisms. Without any further ado, I will leave the stage to Arthur. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paolo, and thank you, ERI, for hosting this webinar on the Sparta earthquake, and also for assembling this excellent panel of colleagues, collaborators, and researchers to talk about it. So the Sparta earthquake happened in, <clears throat> in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Northwest North Carolina. So to start it off with, let's go, we'll look at some of the regional geology. We'll talk about Eastern seismicity, seismicity with the earthquake, also some of the focal mechanisms, how it may relate to the regional geology to begin with. So we'll go to the next slide. So the Blue Ridge, is a composite crew of crystalline terrains of igneous and metamorphic rocks range in age from you know mesoproterozoic to paleozoic or or 1.1 billion to 300 million years old they're poly deformed they're affected by four different erogenies or mountain building events it's also it ends up being a large composite thrust sheet so as you see up in the top part of the picture up here the blue ridge is a thrust sheet that's thrust up over rock paleozoic sedimentary rocks of the valley and ridge which are shown here in light blue and then also in, in beige here and so beneath this, you have a large thrust fault carrying the Blue Ridge up. And again, it may be 300, 400 kilometers. And so one thing is you kind of notice on these maps here, there are a lot of faults drawn on here. However, all these are all faults. They're all Paleozoic. So we'll zoom in next here into some of the geology of in the eastern Blue Ridge around Sparta. Next. So this is a, a map of the uh, geology of the eastern Blue Ridge here which again for Sparta's look Sparta earthquake here is a red red um, star and it's um, underlain by largely neoproterozoic to paleozoic uh, metamorphic rocks of the ash and alligator back metamorphic suite they're primarily metasedimentary rocks 
Porcelophilosopathic mycanisis, schists, amphibolites, and ultramafic rocks. Again, metamorphic, they're amphibolite grade, and they're also intruded by, by Mississippian 335 million old granites shown here, pink, the Stone Mountain, Mount Airy granites. So let's continue on to let's see what some of the rocks look like. Next slide. So again, they're metamorphic rocks. This is some of the uh, meta two mycanises of ash, ash metamorphic suite. You can see up in the top here, these rocks are, have folds in them. So they're polydeformed. They have lots of foliation or layering within them. Um, they're metamorphic. In the lower picture on the right, you can see the large garnet here beside the pencil. And also they're, they're de strongly deformed, they're sheared. Here's a lens of quartz and feldspar. There's also it has little tails tipping out, it's been sheared out. And these rocks, not only are they ductally deformed, if you go back on the top of that last slide, you'll see that they're cut by brittle faults or brittle fractures in the rocks as well. Um, so then moving into Eastern seismicity. So again, this is a, it's intraplate seismicity. There's no plate boundaries that are causing the seismicity. And so we have several known zones of seismicity. There's Eastern Tennessee seismic zone out in, in East Tennessee, uh, west of the Blue Ridge. There's also the Central Virginia seismic zone and the Giles Mountain seismic, uh, Giles County seismic zone in Virginia. However, the blue star marks the Sparta earthquake and it's not in any of these zones. There's no previous zones of, you know, not any you know, strong seismicity associated with it. So it was a pretty surprising thing. And then also if you'll kind of notice or note that most of these earthquakes that are shown here are less than magnitude three. So most of them are two or less and barely even felt. So next slide. Next slide. Um, this is just a stress map, again, showing again the general state of stress within North America. So if we look again, we're north into Northwest North Carolina, where Sparta earthquake is, you can see that again, it's just kind of this red to green where it's in this transitional zone from where we'd have a, you know, compressional reverse, uh, reverse folding to strike slip folding shown in green. And again, the maximum stress is only in Northeast Southwest. So next slide. And the Sparta earthquake, it was felt across the law of Eastern US into uh, the Great Plains and also into Canada as shown on this, the, the USGS shake map or did you feel it map. There's over 104,000 responses. And, you know, with, you know, pretty strong shaking in the epicentral area to very, you know, very minor without I guess that'll be talked about more later in the in the in the talk here, and also the amount of damage to the building. One of the good positive things: there's no loss of life, life associated with this earthquake. So next slide. So when we go into the earthquake, the large bubble right here is the main event, the Magna 5.1 earthquake that happened on August the 9th um, in 2020. Um, Again, we see there's a large scatter of, of aftershocks now. There's almost, there's been over 200 aftershocks associated with the earthquake, but largely they're not showing any apparent pattern. So as you kind of see, they're mostly scattered throughout this area in the Blue Ridge. So next slide. And when we look also at the aftershocks, again, you know, the graph on the top shows the cumulative amount of uh, earthquakes over time. With again, down, down bottom left, we see where again, the strongest five is down at the bottom. And on the lower one, it shows the magnitude over time. And you can see the strongest one here happens at the beginning. And in general, the frequency and the strength of the earthquakes are decreasing over time. You know, most of the magnitudes twos have ended by, you know, August, uh, by um, beginning of September. However, recently on, on September 22nd, there's another magnitude two. So moving on from there, we'll look at the focal mechanisms. So there have been two focal mechanisms determined for this earthquake. They both indicate oblique reverse, uh, reverse faulting. Now, the only difference is mainly the difference of depth. For one on the left here is, is possibly a depth of 11.5 and the other one on the right is a depth possibly three kilometers. Uh, the focal planes are, are largely you know, striking northwest at 300 and dipping to the northeast or striking almost north-south and dipping to the west. Next slide. Um, one other point to note there, the P axis is, is parallel to the maximum stress field throughout here. And they'll talk more about the possible focalisms and depths uh, associated with these here next. Next. Okay. 
And one of the other really significant or interesting parts of this, there was surface rupture associated with it. This will be talked again more, you know, talked about further within the, the uh, seminar here. But we had surface rupture, we have a trench where we were able to excavate the fault, and it has a trend of 115 dipping 45, or kind of trending a fault that trends. Hit return, please, once here. Or, and the little red line will show up here for the fault. But it trends kind of east, east, southeast, and dips back to the southwest. Um, and so, you know, this has a length here where several segments kind of string out over two and a half kilometers where we've mapped uh, surface rupture. So the important question is, what is the relationship between focal mechanisms, the map fault, and the regional geology? Next slide. Okay, there's the, there's the fault rupture. Next slide. So here, this, uh, here on the right, we have a geologic map of the area by ranking others from 1972. Shows again some of the different units throughout. And then on the left here, we have a stereo net showing again the focal mechanisms in black. You can see again the one the north-south, one that dips to the west, and then the uh, 300 one that dips to the northeast. And that's where you can kind of see they bend into it. The red plane is the, the, the fault that was measured in the trench. And right off, we see the focal mechanisms do not match what was the orientation of the fault mapped in the trench. And not only that, when we look at the map, if we use the star plots here, the epicenter of the earthquake, the red line shows, again, where the surface rupture is at. The two green lines match, match up for the focal mechanisms. We see they start to match up. The yellow lines are the projection of the focal surfaces to the surface if they are either at a depth of, of three and a half kilometers or 7.6 kilometers. So right off, we're seeing that with the fault we mapped at depth, don't, doesn't match up with the, uh, the, the surface rupture, does not match with the focal mechanism. So if we hit return, go to the next slide. Next slide here shows again, these rocks are metamorphic. So we look at a lot of the foliations with metamorphic layering within the rocks. Go back one slide, please. Um, you can see all these blue lines. So the large structural fabric within the Blue Ridge is oriented with the layering or in kind of northeast, southwest, and dipping to the southeast. And again, we see that again, the surface rupture crosses this, does not match up with them. And so even the, the possible focal mechanisms at depth. Next slide. This shown here is again, the rocks are fractured and jointed. So these are some of the joints that are measured throughout the area. And although there's a lot of scatter of them, we start to see that there are several joints that are matching up with at least of the surface rupture of the Little River Fault here, with some of the trends, trends going again, somewhere at 110, 120, or also at about um, off and into the Northwest as well here. So there is joints, a small set of joints do line up with the, the, the surface rupture. Next, when we look at the depth, most of the earthquakes we see are pretty shallow, one to three kilometers. The main shock is at 7.6 kilometers. And in this cross section here from A to B prime, which goes across the Little River Fault, we can almost see maybe there is some alignment of things of falling structures dipping back to the Southwest, which would match with the, you know, the rupture of the Little River Fault. Although it seems again, there's several still scattered throughout. And of course there's some deeper and comparing it over time, we see most of the deep, the deep, stronger ones were deeper at the beginning. And then most of the, the later ones, the weaker ones were again, much shallower. Next slide. So if we plot these up onto a geologic cross section, we can see again that if the depth of focal, if the depth of 7.6 kilometers is the focal mechanism, the earthquake happened again below probably the Blue Ridge thrust sheet near the base of Blue Ridge thrust sheet. Again, these are again in um, in some old rocks. The you know fault likely would not we've mapped at the surface would not propagate up to it. Most of the others may fall somewhere into the upper crust. Where again we're you know, falling into to some of the little adjustment of the crust within the um, eastern Blue Ridge rocks and metamorphism. But largely, we don't see a consistent pattern with a massive seismogenic fault and the focal mechanism, location of the earthquake, and trend of the Little River surface rupture did not match the map geology. And so I guess there's now the intro right there, and we'll I'll stop. 
Thank you so much. Uh, just uh, one technical detail for the attendees. Um, we will answer any questions at the end of the presentation. I've seen some uh, hands raised. Please um, keep your um, questions for the end. You can start writing them down and we'll be answering them um, at the end of the presentation. This is due uh, to the um, large number of speakers we have tonight, so we don't want to interrupt the flow. Um, now we have Dr. Kevin Stewart from UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, his presentation is on possible surface expressions of active faults in the North Carolina Blue, Blue Ridge. Thank you, Paolo. Um, as, as Arthur pointed out well, the uh, fault that broke during the Sparta earthquake did not match up with any of the mapped faults that we have in that area. All the faults that we've mapped are old, and this uh, clearly didn't match up with any of those. But what I'd like to show you today is some evidence that we think um, we can present that shows some possible culprits for other magnitude 5 earthquakes that have happened in North Carolina. And this slide uh, with the big circles uh, is showing four magnitude 5 earthquakes, including the most recent one in Sparta. And what I'd like to show you today is that that orientation that Arthur was uh, describing of the fractures and the joints, the sort of 100 to 120 degrees, is significant. Next slide, please. This is a uh, uh, drone air photo mosaic of one part of the area that broke uh, during the Sparta earthquake. And you can see those red lines that are crossing across parking lots uh, across the road. Uh, those are fault ruptures associated with the Little, Little River Fault and north is straight up. So these again are trending roughly 110 degrees. Next slide. And that area that I just showed you is on the left edge of this uh, air photo. And this is now showing all of the surface ruptures that we've been able to map so far. Again, this is now called the Little River Fault. Um, it is trending, again, about 110 degrees and does not correspond to any of the uh, mapped uh, faults in the area. They're, they're all much older and in different orientations. Um, if we look at the focal plane mechanisms, Again, we're seeing this sort of northwest trend. Uh, it's not exactly clear which of these surfaces slipped during the fault, but uh, very likely it was the, the faults that are, uh, it's going to be trending somewhat in the northwest direction. Next slide. This is a, a more uh, uh, zooming out, looking at a digital elevation model of the area around Sparta. So the town of Sparta is marked with a circle. The epicenter of the 5.1 earthquake is shown there. And then superimposed upon this digital elevation model is uh, INSAR uh, satellite data, which shows us which parts moved up and which parts moved down during the earthquake. And so the parts that uh, are in red moved up, the parts that moved down are in blue. And so one thing that you can see on this picture is a pretty uh, sharp contrast between the red and blue that's trending roughly northwest southeast going across this image. Um, if you let your eyes drift down to the southeast, you actually can see a relatively straight river valley heading off to the southeast. And uh, next slide. If I draw uh, red lines on those, the upper part of that red line is, oops, can we go back a slide, please? Um, the upper red line is showing the trace of the Little River Fault, and then a slight bend uh, matching the edge of the uh, biggest gradient in uplift uh, could conceivably be projected to that uh, relatively straight river valley, a topographic lineament. And so what I'd like to show you on the next slide is Western North Carolina in a shaded relief map and the locations of the four known magnitude 5 earthquakes that have happened. Um, Sparta's at the top, we've got uh, one in 1861, further south 1926, and the further south one was 1916. Uh, next slide. These boxes are outlining topographic lineaments, and 
if we go just south of Sparta and we're looking around the Boone, North Carolina area, we call that the Boone Lineament Swarm. And I think you can pretty clearly see a set of topographic lineaments, very straight valleys that are trending again about west-northwest. Uh, these are essentially parallel to the surface break of the Little River Fault. Um, let's zoom in on that one. Next slide. Uh, the Boone uh, Lineament Swarm has uh, several uh, very straight linear valleys indicated by those red arrows, and they are parallel to a fault uh, that Jesse Hill and I have mapped recently uh, that we've named the Boone Fault. It is clearly a much younger fault than the other faults in the area. It's brittle. It has a dip-slip motion, and we believe that this fault uh, has a likely Cenozoic motion on it. Next slide. Uh, although there are no large earthquakes recorded on the Boone Fault, uh, there have been small ones. And there have been a number of magnitude two to magnitude three earthquakes uh, that are uh, it's certainly in the area of the Boone Fault. Um, these are the epicenters. So depending on the dip of the Boone Fault, which does seem to dip rather steeply, uh, probably to the south, these could project uh, down to the Boone Fault at depth. So we believe this west-northwest fault may be a, a similar kind of structure to one that slipped at Sparta. Next slide. Uh, moving down to the 1926 earthquake, that was a magnitude five. And it seems to be located on something uh, that we've called the Laurel Creek lineament. And you might be able to notice that very prominent east-west valley running across the map there. Uh, next slide. This is a uh, little three-dimensional model looking uh, west along the Laurel Creek lineament. Uh, Mount Mitchell on the right, those are the uh, Black Mountains, the highest mountain range east of the Rockies. And the red dot is showing uh, the location, the approximate location of the 1926 magnitude 5 earthquake, which certainly seems to be uh, at least close to this feature. Um, I always sort of look at this feature and think that, you know, if such a straight linear valley were in California, I don't think people would have much doubt that this was associated with a fault zone. So uh, there is seismicity along this feature. Next slide. Uh, in addition to the magnitude 5 earthquake in 1926, which seems to be at the uh, east end of this lineament, there have been a number of magnitude 2s and 3s as well, um, including a magnitude 3.8 at the far west end of this lineament in uh, 2005. Next slide. And focal plane solutions for this uh, earthquake, the one uh, from 2005, again, are consistent with this sort of west-northwest or east-west um, fault zone. Next. The Laurel Creek lineament, now we're looking back to the east, is a pretty straight valley. Uh, it actually crosses I-26, uh, uh, inter a north-south interstate that runs north from Asheville, North Carolina. And one of the interesting or, or maybe um, worrisome features of this lineament is that it crosses very near the Laurel Creek Gorge Bridge, uh, I-26 Highway Bridge. Uh, which is the second highest bridge in North Carolina at over uh, 200 feet high. Um, hopefully that's not too fragile of a structure. Next slide. Uh, so now moving down uh, to the next lineament swarm to the south, the Swannanoa lineament. There are no magnitude five earthquakes clearly associated with the Swannanoa lineament. There are small earthquakes. But what I'd like to do is zoom in on a section of this lineament, which is just west of Asheville. Next slide. And there's a beautiful exposure uh, along I-40, and you can see that very sharp uh, line sort of cutting through the topography there. And that exposure, I think, gives us a clue as to what's controlling this lineament. Next slide. In the uh, road cut uh, through this area, all of those sort of shiny surfaces that you can see, those smooth, shiny, shiny surfaces are fracture surfaces and joint planes. And they are all uh, dipping to the south uh, quite steeply, but all running parallel to the lineament. Next slide. 
Here's a three-dimensional model. Again, now we're looking west down that lineament. Um, fractures that have been measured outside the lineament are shown by the rose diagrams on the left and right. And you can see there's a wide variety of orientations. But if we look uh, at the fractures in the lineament, they're very strongly parallel to the lineament. So it's pretty clearly a lineament that is fracture controlled. Um, likely associated with some kind of a slip. Uh, the fourth magnitude five earthquake in North Carolina, at least that we know about, uh, was in 1916. And it seems to correspond to an area uh, that were, there's the Mills Gap area and the Hick Hickory Nut Gorge lineament swarm. And so you might be able to see some, again, west northwest trending lineaments running through that area. Um, next slide. And the arrow now at the bottom showing Mills Gap fault zone. Uh, the magnitude five earthquake, at least based on the uh, best guess of where it was located, seems to be located right along uh, that feature. Uh, Rick Wooten in the next talk will uh, show you some pictures of the Mills Gap fault zone, but it clearly has Cenozoic um, motion as well. Next slide. So as Arthur pointed out before, the um, modern day stress map is showing this north east southwest direction for maximum compressive stress. Uh, if we have this compressive stress acting on the lineaments, uh, next slide. For instance, the Boone lineament swarm, uh, some of these other lineament swarms that are trending uh, west northwest, that would translate then to reverse motion, which is exactly what we're seeing in Sparta. So we think that these, uh, uh, next slide. So we think that the uh, Western North Carolina is cut by these topographic lineaments, which all have a, a, this west-northwest, sometimes east-west trend. They all correspond to zones of intense fracturing and some are actually documented fault zones. And these features uh, seem like uh, good candidates for the past magnitude five earthquakes that have affected North Carolina and possibly may be good candidates for future earthquakes. Thank you. All right, so our next speaker is Richard Wooden from NCGS. Um, and I will leave to him. Please, leave, Richard, go ahead. All right, thank you, Paulo. And uh, thank you, Kevin and Arthur for a good introduction. So I'm going to be covering some of the same topics that Arthur and Kevin did and a little different perspective on those. I'm going to review some of the previous interplate earthquakes in the eastern U.S. Again, you can see the Sparta earthquake, uh, the magnitude 5.1. And this is on a map uh, showing the other earthquake epicenters in North Carolina and the surrounding states. So all the magnitude 5 and greater earthquakes are shown by the orange dots. And as Arthur pointed out, the Sparta earthquake doesn't fall neatly into any of the, the known existing uh, seismic zones like the Eastern Tennessee seismic zone to the Southwest, the Giles County seismic zone, or the Central Virginia seismic zone. Um, what I will talk about though is in the next slide is the Charleston, South Carolina earthquake in 1886. That's the largest recorded earthquake in historical times in the Southeast. And that estimated magnitude uh, it was on the order of 6.9 to 7.3 with a maximum intensity of 10. Uh, in 1886, the damage uh, value was placed at five to six million dollars. That would be about 160 million dollars today. There were 100, there were at least 60 fatalities. I think one thing you will notice on the isoseismal map on the left is the large felt area of the earthquake. So that earthquake was felt over most of the eastern United States. And the top center slide, you can see the deflection of the railroad rails by the earthquake. And in the top right, you can see one of the many damaged buildings in the Charleston Historic District. And so if you go to Charleston, North uh, South Carolina today and walk along the Historic District, you will notice a lot of the historic structures have earthquake bolts. And this photo on the bottom right, you can see the flanges of those two bolts. And I think most of these are retrofitted after the 1886 earthquake. But uh, this is a present day reminder of that uh, extremely large earthquake that happened over 130 years ago. So next slide, please. Now we'll move on to uh, two more recent earthquakes. Uh, 
Kevin mentioned the Skyland earthquake in 1916. So the isoseismal map for that earthquake is on the left. And you can see uh, for a magnitude 5.2 earthquake, that had a pretty large felt area as well. And so the epicenter is just southwest of Asheville, exactly where I live. So I have a vested interest in this earthquake. And the damage from the Skyland earthquake is not dissimilar to what we saw have seen in these Sparta earthquake. There were chimney chops thrown down, uh, many window panes were broken. And in Sevierville, Tennessee, if we could back up one slide real quick. Uh, there were, you know, bricks taken from chimneys and increases in spring flow. And of course, everybody probably knows about the Mineral Virginia earthquake in 2011, a magnitude 5.8. So next slide, please. So what I'm going to cover briefly are some of the co-seismic ground surface ruptures that we've been mapping. This is a map that uh, Kevin and Arthur showed earlier, and all these red lines are surface ruptures associated with the earthquake. And what we've been able to identify so far are two distinct types. There are those that are fault related, you know, the surface rupture or surface expression of the fault. But there are also slide related ground ruptures with have to do with the ground shaking. And to date, most of those we've identified are in uh, constructed fill slopes. Uh, next slide, please. So well, I'm going to start with a, a brief description of one of the surface ruptures, and, and Paula is going to go into this much more detail later. So in the top right, you can see the trench where uh, the surface rupture is exposed of the Little River Fault, and the hanging wall, the HW, is to the left, and that's the overriding block that overrides the foot wall on the right. And the bottom right hand side, you can see it'll get a little bit closer view of that fault. And one of the interesting things about this fault that Arthur mentioned also, there's evidence in the, in the rock fabric of multiple movements. There's uh, gouge and breccia from brittle movements, and those are rooted in a, a ductile shear zone, uh, which indicates some of these movements along this fault or this fault zone are probably of great antiquity. So it's probably been active for some time. However, we don't have any idea at this point of what the ages of those movements are. And the image on the left, uh, that's, uh, we could back up quickly. Yeah, the image on the left shows the, the buckling in the metal uh, siding on this building, which gives you a pretty good kinematic indicator that the relative movement, the, the shortening direction is shown by the blue arrows. And so the hanging wall is moving towards the north northeast, and uh, that resulted in the buckling and the rippling in this siding, metal siding on the building. Next slide, please. So here one is one more, a couple of examples of uh, surface rupture related to the fault. The top left photograph is a, a shortening structure. You can see where the pavement is buckled, and that's also where a water mine was, uh, water water main was broken the time of the earthquake. And that's located, uh, and you see the image on the right, which is actually a 3D digital surface model from a UAS, 2D UAS images. And you can see the, the trace of the fault. So that road is at the, uh, the northwest end of this image. And on the bottom left photograph, you can see the surface rupture of the fault near uh, an old barn. So the hanging wall here, or the upthrown block, is labeled HW and the foot wall is labeled FW. So that's an, another example of the surface rupture related to faulting. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna talk uh, about some of the slide related ground ruptures and fill slopes. And there, there are probably a couple of dozen of these that we've identified so far. So in the photograph on the left, you can see this small scarp with centimeter scale vertical offset. This is in a, a fill slope constructed at a commercial building site. In the uh, center photograph, you can see this ground uh, crack or scarp. It's actually uh, occurred in fill, but it's propagated up through a layer of concrete and a layer of asphalt. And all the gravel that you see on the surface area is aggregate that's been placed uh, in the accessible parts of these scarps to kind of cover them up. So maybe nobody will know they're there. And on the photograph on the right, you can see these arcuate ground scarps related to sliding in an artificial fill slope. And so these failures in fill slopes are not new to North Carolina. These are the, the only ones we know of to date that are uh, 
earthquake related, but we have about 600 or so uh, embankment type failures documented in our landslide database. Next slide, please. So one more example of uh, slide related ground ruptures and fill slopes. This is uh, located at the west northwest end of the uh, fault trace. You can see in the map in the bottom center. These are actually cracks in the uh, downslope berm of a sediment retention basin. And uh, in the photograph on the far right, you can see some of the smaller scale cracks in the highly saturated sediment in the sediment basin. Uh, so this, uh, in addition to an indication of the shaking from the shaking level from the earthquake, this situation right here obviously poses some potential future hazard. If we have excessive rainfall events and we have uh, a lot of uh, water ponded in the sediment retention basin that's infiltrating into the slope and increasing pore water pressure. So uh, if this were to mobilize into a debris flow, an excessive rain event, it could conceivably block a US-21, at least temporarily. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk briefly about the, the overall magnitude of the damage here to commercial structures. RE is gonna go into that in more detail later. But the Allegheny County Emergency Management conducted a uh, survey of damaged structures in the area. And that map on the left shows all the black crosses of those structures that have been damaged. And there are over 600. And so the dollar value for that damage is on the order of $15 million. So the, the, the level of damage is not high. It's light to moderate, but it's very widespread. And so probably uh, over 95% of the population there does not have, does not have earthquake uh, insurance. So next slide, please. And so the good news is that uh, there are hundreds of high hazard dams in Western North Carolina, but none of them have reported any damage related to the Sparta earthquake. The image on the right shows the location of high hazard dams. And this data is from uh, the Division of Energy, Minerals and Land Resources. Uh, that's our division, but we have a dam safety program. And so these folks contacted all the, the dam owners and to date there've been no reports of significant damage to the high hazard dams in Western North Carolina. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna recap some of the uh, ideas that uh, Kevin brought forward and I, I think he made some really good points. So one of the things we see in Western North Carolina are these West Northwest trending post orogenic you know, after the mountain building episodes and brittle cross structures that cut across the geologic and topographic grain. So these features are not only related to earthquakes and seismicity, but also landslides and hydrogeology. So they have other implications for engineering geology and environmental geology in Western North Carolina. So you can see the uh, liniment swarm near the Little River Fault in the Northeast there and going to the Southwest, the Boone Fault, and associated seismicity. Uh, one other uh, documented series of earthquakes occurred in 1848 and 1874 in the Hickory Nut Gorge area. And what's interesting in that area is it's a very steep gorge and there are very large uh, rockfall deposits in that gorge, which conceivably could be co-seismic. So that's an area of further investigation. And that liniment swarm uh, extends to the Northwest to the Mills Gap Fault Zone, which is in the epicentral area of the 1916 Skyland earthquake. So uh, next slide, please. So here's some images uh, that shows uh, the results of the investigation we did. Uh, it started out, we were not investigating this area for a fault. We were cooperating with the USGS to do a geologic and hydrogeologic framework investigation for what was to become a uh, EPA Superfund site known as the CTS Superfund site. And in the course of that investigation, we identified the Mills Gap Fault Zone, which is another one of these west northwest trending post orogenic brittle cross structures. And so well, there's very strong evidence that this also Cenozoic in movement because one of the strands of this fault zone actually cuts across and deforms surficial deposits or colluvium. And in the bottom left there, you can see uh, the rose diagram of the faults, uh, the 36 faults measured in that area. And so you can see a very strong west-northwest and east-northeast trending pattern, which uh, correspond to that Hickory Nut Gorge 
uh, Mills Gap fault zone lineament swarm, but also there's some faults in there that correspond to the east northeast trending Swannanoa liniment that Kevin mentioned earlier. And also in the rose diagram of the fractures, you can see that that clearly that west northwest trend. Uh, next slide, please. So to wrap it up, um, just to point out that uh, not only are these cross structures related to earthquakes and hydrogeology, they're also related to landslide occurrence, not co-seismic landslide occurrence. But where these cross structures and lineament storms cross the Blue Ridge Escarpment, and that's the, the mountain front here in Western North Carolina, it separates the Piedmont to the east and the Blue Ridge to the west. Uh, these are um, steeply, uh, uh, eroded, erosional reentrance incised into the Blue Ridge Escarpment. So where these liniment swarms and faults cut across the Blue Ridge Escarpment, these are areas of concentrated landslide activity. Uh, we don't have any landslides mapped in the Little River Fault area, but we haven't done any mapping there. So that may be something that comes out of future studies. But certainly in the deep gap area where the Boone Fault and that liniment swarm crosses the Blue Ridge Escarpment, there's a high concentration of landslides. Uh, there's rock slope instability concerns along the Boone Fault itself and in the deep gap reentrant where this liniment storm crosses the Blue Ridge Escarpment. There were over 600 debris flows in a, uh, triggered by a 1940 tropical cyclone. So if we go down southwest to Hickory Nut Gorge, that's another area of concentrated landslide activity and also in the Pakalet River Valley to the south. And so at this point, I am done and thank you. And I'm going to turn over the talk to Paula. Thank you so much, Rick. Now we are going to talk about surface deformation associated with the, to the magnitude 5.8 Esparta earthquake. Uh, our speaker now will be Dr. Paula Figueredo from NC State University. Uh, she will be uh, speaking on behalf of the uh, of, of Dr. Lewis Owen. So please, Paula, go ahead. Hello. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction, Arthur, uh, Kevin, and, and Rick. Today, I will speak about the surface deformation associated with the Sparta earthquake. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yes. So we can we know based on the focal mechanism and on the in, interferogram from Sentinel that the main structure is a northwest southeast structure. Um, we um, know as well based on the unwrapped phase of the INSAR that the southwest side came up was uplifted in regards to the northeast. So the color red indicates that that side. Um, was uplifted and the blue indicate that that area was uh, subsided. The focal mechanism indicate also that it was a reverse fault uh, with a slight oblique component. And there are, as Arthur and the others mentioned already, different uh, solutions for the focal mechanism depending on the depth. Um, our preferred solution is the shallowest one instead of, of the, the roughly eight kilometers. We prefer the solution of three kilometers depth because it's the shallower one. Um, next slide, please. If we look to the aftershocks sequence in section, if we do a cross section to the aftershock um, seismicity in, in the larger area, and if we do a cross section south north, using a latitude versus deep, we see that the alignments tend to the, the earthquakes tend to align in a structure that will south, uh, will dip to the south. And if we do a west-east cross section, we will see that there is patterns suggesting a dipping to the west. So this all together indicates and reinforces that at least for the upper three kilometers, um, there is a south dipping structure and in that regard looking to the focal mechanism uh, the nodal plane that fits that has a strike of 165. Uh, next slide please. 
So there is a close relationship between the moment magnitude and the surface magnitude. The moment magnitude indicates this uh, area that rupture along the fault plane in depth. Um, obviously, a larger moment magnitude will have uh, a larger area at the surface, will impact a larger area at the surface, and it will also cause a largest degree of damage at the surface. Um, but this is also related with depth. If you have a large um, moment magnitude, but a larger depth, it will not be as felt as if you have um, the same moment magnitude with a shallower uh, depth. Um, based on the what we know from most um, earthquakes that we saw th their effects directly and from paleoseismology records, we know that there is a threshold for an earthquake to generally produce damage at the surface or not. And that threshold is uh, between 5.5 to 6, more or less. So if you have an earthquake with a moment magnitude um, larger than 6, it will likely produce damage at the surface displacement of the topographic surface. And you will see cumulative displacements of this through time. If you tend to have small size uh, earthquakes, this will not happen. So Sparta earthquake was not expected to have um, deformation at the surface, but yet it did, which suggests that maybe the earthquake, the rupture close to the surface in depth. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, please. So how rare are these moderate earthquakes that actually cause surface rupture? They are not very frequent, but they do exist. The last one that we know that uh, happened and caused some damage, it happened last year, 2019, in the south of France, was the Littel earthquake that had a magnitude of 4.9, causing a maximum displacement of 15 centimeters along a rupture of five kilometers long. Uh, however, there are other cases. There is one also in 2010, a magnitude 5 caused surface rupture. This was associated with a strike slip. The I forgot saying the French one was also associated to a reverse fault. And then there is also the interesting case of an earthquake in Australia, the Kalingiri earthquake in 1970, that only had a magnitude 5, yet it also cause a displacement up to 40 centimeters along a rupture three kilometers long. Um, I want to highlight that Australia um, being an intraplate setting and it's a, a craton where you would not expect active tectonics to happen, has several examples of moderate uh, earthquakes that cause surface deformation. Um, and um, uh, it, it's, it was, has been studied that most of this information is related with previous um, structures, all the structures existing in the bedrock, and they are reactivated for recent times. Next slide, please. So we have been talking about reverse fault uh, for the ones I don't know exactly what that is. What would we expect to see at the surface when you have an event caused by a reverse fault? So a reverse fault we put one of the sides of the fault on top of the other side. One side will go up face uh, regards to the other. And um, the effects at the surface are highly dependent also on the materials that are affected by this displacement. If you have a fault arriving at the surface in consolidated rocks, um, it's likely that it will produce a step and that step will be preserved. But in other hand, if you do this in a in sediments or rocks that are not as consolidated, um, th this step will likely to collapse and degrade very fast and you will see just a, a sort of ramp. There is also the situation, not I, I highlighted here on this uh, image, where the fault um, reaches very close of the surface and actually do not displace the surface and just causes a flexure, a folding of the surface. Next slide, please.
Um, so this is a comparison between the deformation resulting from the Chichi earthquake, which was also in the reverse fault, and it was a magnitude 7.7, .7, produced a scarp uh, larger than one meter, and one example from Sparta uh, that Rick has mentioned this already. Um, so this is um, along the, the trace of the surface rupture, and we see buckled pavement, and actually the water pipe here was broken. Um, and you can see that it's very similar. It's very similar um, deformation. However, the scale, the degree of intensity, it's much different. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about then some of what we saw along the trace of the surface rupture. This is a very simplified map of the, the the surface rupture when dashed is because we don't really see it that well. We have poor evidence of it. Um, and I'm going to focus on three sites from the west, site number one, to the east, site number three. Next slide, please. So site number one <clears throat> has been shown here before in other uh, slides. Um, it, it um, was identified in an in industrial park, and here we see several uh, strands of deformation. So you see several um, displacements of the topography, several let's um, faults that you can see highlighted by the red arrows, and they are disposed in a, um, echelon geometry. And they are dispersed in an area that can be 50 meters wide and along um, 20, 20, 200 meters long. Um, I also uh, want to, to point the location of T1, which, which is a trench that we excavated. Next slide, please. And this is the aspect of the scarps in the industrial park. Um, they are quite impressive, not as impressive as the ones that we are used to see on the big earthquakes, but they are quite impressive for this type of, of earthquake. Um, the one on the left has almost 20 centimeters high, it's very close to that, and it's again, the scarp is highlighted by the red arrows. And um, the one on, on the right subdivides in two tiny scarps on a total of 12 centimeters high. And um, th this is a sketch of what we call the hanging wall and the foot wall. So you will see several pictures with the HW and the FW um, naming the, the different two blocks of this type of faulting. Next slide, please. So this is, um, we decided to, to open a trench to see how these scarps were rooted in the geology because we were not aware of what was the geological feature, the structure that might be associated with this. Um, next slide, please. And here we were able to identify the superficial layers um, that I, that they are displaced by a low angle, very shallow uh, plane. And the layers are actually displaced about 10 centimeters along the, this plane, um, producing a vertical deformation of four centimeters. So here you have this tiny scarp um, of four centimeters. And when you go deeper, you see that this deformation gets rooted on a, um, an older uh, deformation zone that dips now about 50 to the southwest. And um, there are on this area evidences of um, ductile deformation that are later displaced by brittle deformation. As um, has been previously said by, by the other panelists, we don't know the age of this. We know that this is Cenozoic, but we don't know how old or young within the Cenozoic. So we don't know if these are even quaternary or if they are younger. Um, going to the second site, um, this, this is located uh, at, at uh, this road here to the right, uh, is where the, the pavement was buckled. 
And here we see a more linear trend of the surface rupture, again, highlighted by the red arrows, uh, and the location of a second um, trench that we did. Here we did uh, drone imagery, and we surveyed this with RTK, and uh, more recently, we surveyed this with a terrestrial um, uh, laser scan, and we started to do also some preliminary acquisition of ground penetration radar. Next slide, please. So uh, again, to try to investigate what type of deformation were we obtaining, what, what caused the scarp here, there was a, a tiny scarp, uh, the road was fixed, so the, the picture of the, of the road was, um, uh, they fixed the, the water pipe broke on the road the same day of the earthquake. Um, and then we saw that there was a continuation in a tiny scarp. We decided to, to open a trench to see if we could identify similar deformation to what we've seen in site one. Next slide, please. And here, this is a trench log. Um, and here, the upper layer, which is the dark brown one, is actually not displaced, it's just flexure is bended. We try to identify uh, fault planes that will affect the, the layers that were deeper, the, the beneath the dark um, brown layer, the, the upper one. Um, we were not able to see any displacement of the geological um, references. There was a suggestion of planes, um, but Regardless, we were not able to track any um, displacement of the geology. So here uh, we think that we are seeing more a flexure than the, the topographic displacement itself. Continuing to, to the east side three, um, we always were able to find a tiny scarp up to 20 kilometers. Um, the picture on, on the left is within the the hoods you have also the image on the uh, open field next slide please and this is an image on the open field it's still really well expressed and, and quite uh, impressive but you still have the vegetation next slide please So we decided to remove the vegetation and exposing much better the scarp trace. And uh, um, we surveyed this with terrestrial laser scan, which we are still processing the image and start con con doing GPR. So um, um, we are here also acquiring GPR. Next slide, please. This is back to site two. Those are some lines of where we did GPR. And you can see these profiles are um, N, N east, south, southwest. And you can see highlighted by the red arrows that there is a reflector that is a shallow and a low angle plane dipping to the, to the southwest again. Uh, we did also a line, a GPR line, where we had the trench, so by the trench, and we were not able to identify the same reflector. This is consistent with the absence of a fault plane in the trench, so maybe um, at the site of the road, the fault was deeper and not really um, reaching the surface and just producing a flexure, a buckling of the surface. Next slide, please. And so to conclude, um, we do know that the Sparta earthquake caused a surface rupture. It was the first time that it was documented in the Eastern US. Um, we think this has a segment of uh, roughly two kilometers and a half um, and the maximum displacement of 20 centimeters. The main deformation zone generally is narrow. It's much less than 50 uh, meters. Um, at, uh, but the deformation area where you will have other slight features and ground um, cracking is wider with uh, 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 up to 800 to meters to one kilometer. 
the surface expression of the rupture is expressed by, by fault and folding associated with a reverse um, uh, fault. And all of this that we are seeing, this, this uh, reverse faulting and, um, and, and brittle and fragile um, displacements are, uh, that we are calling the little river fault are likely to be um, a old fabric that has been reactivated Regardless, we don't have yet a clear evidence of Holocene or late Pleistocene deformation, meaning we don't have uh, information of this happening during the last 12,000 years or uh, five, five, 50,000 years. Next slide, please. And so there are questions, obviously. So what do we need to know to understand this earthquake better? Um, and what is causing this earthquake? Um, so first of all, when did it happen, the previous earthquake, and, and how big was it? And we are planning to do more trenches to investigate this. And a question that we all have, I think, is um, if there is um, a blind structure um, more deep, um, that it's somehow associated with this more superficial um, structure, since there is an angle between what we are mapping and the INSAR and the, the, the focal mechanisms. And if that's the case, if this is an indicator of more um, older fractures that have been reactivated with this earthquake, how can we anticipate for events like this in the future? Because these structures are all, all over the place in North Carolina. And that's it. Thank you. Oh, yes. Um, a, a reminder that I forgot as well. Next October 15, please don't, don't forget the shakeout to train uh, how to act during an earthquake. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paula. Um, now we're going to talk about structural observations. We have Ariane de Palma and Mervyn Kowalski from NC State University. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so it turns out that Sparta is also famous for earthquakes, but this is another Sparta in Greece, and this is uh, this famous earthquake in 464 BCE was known for destroying much of the city and the surrounding cities in ancient Greece, and it actually led to the first Peloponnesian War. Just a fun fact. Uh, to start our structural observations, uh, this is a view of the town of Sparta. It's a very rural area, as you can see in the top two pictures. From other speakers, you have already heard that North Carolina has not had an earthquake of this magnitude in the last 100 years. And this is the first, uh, the largest recorded earthquake, meaning quantitatively we have data of this um, record in North Carolina. The blue star is where Sparta is located, very near the, um, uh, the states of Virginia and Tennessee. So um, looking at the intensity and the peak ground motion acceleration scales provided by the USGS allows us to have an idea of the overall impact of this earthquake. In the left is the Mercalli scale, which is based on the Did You Feel It report. And close to the epicenter, you can see that according to the intensity scale, uh, these events reach a level between six and seven at close to Sparta, this is four kilometers southeast of the town of Sparta, which uh, means strong shaking and uh, light damage. And if you focus on the right, the peak ground motion or PGA plot, you can see the distribution of the accelerations as uh, caused by this event. So in the middle, you see the star located the epicenter of this earthquake. And what you can tell is that it's estimated to be at the location of the epicenter of 20% G. And it decreases very quickly as you move farther away from the epicenter. There are 17 recording stations that were able to capture the ground motion 
due to this event. I have highlighted here the ones with the highest levels of acceleration as a percentage of G. As you can tell in this column of PGA, these levels of acceleration as a percentage of PGA are very, very low. Um, interestingly, the highest one is 3% close to the city of Charlotte, North Carolina, but it's still very small demand, 150 kilometers from the epicenter. Unfortunately, we had no uh, station close to the epicenter to be able to measure the level of the demand at this location. So this is a map of the area. I'm highlighting here uh, the town of Sparta and the location of the epicenter with the star. These are at 2,900 feet of elevation. And other uh, interesting parts that I'm going to be discussing in terms of location is the cemetery and the bridge over the Little River. As you can see here, uh, this is a very rural area, and it does not have many large structures, mostly one-story residences. This is a picture taken at the epicenter or as close to the epicenter um, that we could get on the day of the event, two hours afterwards. And as the maximum says, earthquakes occur or happen in pretty places, as you, as you can see. It was a very, very pretty day. <clears throat> so now we're at the downtown Sparta uh, in the middle of downtown. And this is where we start a structural reconnaissance on the day of the event, August 9th at 10 a.m., two hours after the event, which occurred at 8 a.m. that morning. Most of the structures in downtown are two stories uh, maximum, and they're the most um, older structures are located in the, in the downtown area. While there are a small, the tallest one is the city hall, but the city hall is a um, newest and modern building and there were no damage shown here. This building that I'm showing here on the right, located by this green uh, location um, map on the left, um, it's located right across the city hall and as we can see here, the front unreinforced masonry wall sustained some buckling at the, uh, from the weak plane at the point where it um, separated by the rest of the main building and we believe that this is due to the shaking that morning. This whole street that I'm gonna talk about and the observations we had, uh, is mostly uh, composed of little stores um, in the downtown area. So in the next corner, going southeast in Main Street, towards the epicenter, there were many fallen bricks on the ground and mostly uh, coming from this corner building on the far right. Uh, we noticed that this was from the chimneys at the top of the building that essentially uh, broke during the shaking. And this is a common failure on this, under this level of shaking for this type of unreinforced masonry structures. The adjacent building in white also showed some crushing and spalling of the mortar and the brick. As noted by the yellow circle. And it was very fortunate that this event occurred at 8 a.m. in the morning on a Sunday morning because there were not many people on the street. Plus, during this time, they had closed the road for construction or repair of other things in the main street. So thankfully, there were not people because this would be a reason why people could get hurt on this, this level of shaking. Um, the same building uh, on the corner but for another view, we can notice one of the damaged chimneys um, on the inside and the fallen bricks would be laying on top of the adjacent building. And this was taken on the morning of August 9th. We can do a close up of it. You can see here it's very much damaged. And on September 1st, when we came back for another reconnaissance, they were already undergoing um, repair construction of the different chimneys in the, in the main street building. 
So going farther southeast on the main street, we were able to go inside this building I'm showing here. This is a picture of the building before the event. And the manager of the store was on site evaluating and assessing the damage of the inside part. We we're fortunate enough to be able to go in. And next, I'm going to show you what we found. Um, in this case, the store has a suspended ceiling, which uh, behaved rather flexible during the shaking, and it came into contact with this slender column, steel column. And we measured the residual displacement in this column, and there was, uh, it was ne negligible. Um, on the left, you can see the pictures of the ceiling and the front wall of the building, as if you were standing inside the building and observing the front entrance. And what we can see here is buckling of the ceiling support brackets, uh, these aluminum brackets that support the ceiling, uh, suggesting that the motion inside the building was from front to back um, or back to front of the building. The, the, the stores, um, mainly this one, were able to observe uh, many fallen um, little things laying on shelves. In the same matter, the rest of the stores um, account for that same economical loss. Farther on the street, we also came uh, across this unreinforced stone masonry building. This is also a, a picture before the event taken from Google Maps. On the day of the event, if we look at the side view of this building, the, the front wall of the building, um, as pointed by the arrow, sustains some cracking through the mortar between the stones. And you can, um, it appears to have some buckling um, in the wall. And if we focus on the other side of the opening, um, mainly we had a horizontal crack through the mortar at the level of the bottom of the lintel beam, the lintel beam here in gray, um, that is above the opening. And we also had a vertical split through the mortar as well and through the edge of this beam and the stone masonry. Um, and we believe this is due to the top part of this beam uh, sh uh, shaken um, with respect to the rest of the one story. This is more evident, this incipient hinging, when you look at the front of the store. You can see this uh, same behavior of hinging at each one of the columns next to the opening. <clears throat> this implies that the upper story of the facade was rocking at that region, creating this weak plane at each one of the columns. As you can see here in this zoom in, it went right through the mortar. So farther southeast, we kept walking and we uh, ran across this more modern masonry office building. And at first sight, we did not notice any damage. But then we looked closely at the ground and we found some mortar laying there. And we looked up and we seen uh, some um, Similar behavior as what we have observed in the past where we see some falling of this mortar and we focus on this part in the column, right above the column, in between the openings, once again, we see the same behavior. This uh, location is a little bit outside of the historic part of downtown where there's some restaurants. Um, mainly this restaurant, we saw some uh, the, the masonry facade had fallen quite a distance from the face of the restaurant. It's a corner views on the right are the two um, openings of the, um, the two faces of the restaurant. You can see at the top here that the cladding had fallen from here to the, um, the front, front part. And on the parking lot, if there was had been a car there, it would have caused some damage or if there had been people at that time of day. Close by, if you focus on the farthest left picture, there was a structure where you had a roof and the roof was laying or bearing on top um, a series of parallel 
unreinforced masonry walls. And the far, um, you can see that the, not the one in close to us, but the farthest wall, you can see that the roof is varying vertical and compression on top of this wall. And no apparent damage was caused to this wall. But at the edge wall, we see that the edge of the roof is laying in compression, but the beam from the roof is bearing laterally on the inside face of the, of the masonry wall. And due to the shaking, um, this caused the splitting uh, through the mortar and through the whole brick um, of the masonry wall. So due, due to the lateral shaking, this beam was bearing laterally on this wall. So now we have made it to the Little River, and this is the main bridge in this area affected by this event. And so we're going to call it the bridge over the Little River. This was taken on the day September 1st. And if you focus on the elevation of the, of the bridge picture, if you're standing right here under the bridge and face the left, the, sorry, the right, you would see that uh, that is the bottom of the approach of the bridge. And in the farthest right picture, we see that the DOT noted, identified the largest crack due to the, this event on August 9th. And they identified the length and the width, um, 76 or 76 inches long and 0 0.08 inches in width. Sorry, going back. And if we focus on one of the girders um, laying or bearing on top of the first wall pier on the right, we see that there's some cracking coming from the contact between the shear key and the girder. And we believe that this is due to the shaking of the, during the motion that the shear key came into contact with the girder, causing this crack to extend. And this may have been aggravated by previous corrosion in the beam before the event. So at this point, what we have seen is um, overall minor damage and what we expected for this level of magnitude and for the type of structures that are in this location. A little bit past the bridge, uh, farther southeast and closer to the epicenter, we found this um, house, which part of it is constructed with unreinforced un stone masonry as well. We have a front chimney and a back chimney as well. This is a picture from Google uh, Street View before the event, and this is the house that we observed to have the largest this damage, um, very, very noticeable. Um, this were taken as well at 10 a.m. on August 9th. As you can see here, this probably caused a very, very loud noise that woke up all the neighbors. So what we see here is that the front masonry chimney seems to have broken at or fail and a fellow plane occurred when the cross section reduced, as you can see the slope from the largest cross section at the bottom to the top. And we go back, you see that reduction in cross section. At the back, we don't see that reduction in cross section, but we do see that it fell at the change of stiffness. So it probably shook against the house and that created that failure plane for the rest of the chimney. So if we were to take this structure as a way of estimating the level of demand at the site, so this structure, for example, and we focus on the front chimney with the estimated dimensions um, above the failure plane. The four displacement response, we can assume this to be a rigid block. And in this case, the force displacement response of this rigid block would, be a dis would have a descending slope as shown here in this um, image. And if we were to include elastic, elastic flexibility, this force would be slightly smaller. As you can see, this curve here would be including elastic flexibility and this straight line going down would 
uh, not include elastic flexibility. We decided to ignore this uh, for easier calculation for this estimation. And we estimated the, um, the volume, um, the dimensions of this accounting for the flue area as one eighth of the growth area of the chimney. So taking those dimensions and assuming that the ladder of force is distributed along the height of this whole rigid block, then we can <clears throat> use force equilibrium uh, where the gravity load is counterbalanced by the compression force of the masonry. And then we can find the stress block depth here is uh, represented by the letter A. And assuming um, the uh, masonry strength of 3 KSI, we can find the corresponding stress block and we can find a corresponding force that would initiate the rocking for this rigid block. So this force will correspond to this first point in this force displacement curve. Um, divided by the weight, we can find the percentage of gravity that it would take to initiate rocking for this rigid block. Having that in mind, we were able to build this force displacement behavior and any point along this uh, rigid block line will correspond to a different stiffness. So for example, take the middle point, um, 800 pounds of force, we can identify the effective stiffness up to that point just by force over uh, distance. And we can calculate the effective period for this structure uh, just as a function of effective stiffness. And with that, we can calculate the corresponding level of acceleration that it would take to uh, initiate rocking for that for other structure. Doing this for other values of stiffness along this line, we can construct our lower bound spectra, meaning that would be the minimum level of demand that would uh, lead to initiate rocking in this type of structures. So with that process, we were able to construct this spectra with um, having done points at a little bit less than one second, a little bit less than 1.5 seconds, and at 2.5 seconds, we have a lower bound acceleration spectra taking um, our assumptions from the um, rigid block from that chimney. Uh, the results are not sensitive to the masonry strength that we assume just because the stress block depth um, is very, very small relative to the dimensions of the rigid block. So we feel confident about this estimation and, and this, this, as you recall from the PGA um, that I showed earlier, the estimated level of peak ground acceleration given by the USGS gives us confidence as well because we have a level of 22, I'm sorry, 20 percent um, acceleration close to the epicenter as USGS estimated for the epicenter. So other observations for the same stone masonry home, but this uh, picture is taken from the back. And as you can see here, the two locations I'm highlighting on the top picture um, where the foundation meets the rest of the house and the, um, the bottom of one of the columns. You can see that the house rotated counterclockwise during the motion. <clears throat> and there was also translation to the south of the building uh, of this column of three inches translation. In the same manner, we do see that on the side, there's some cracking of the foundation, as shown in the two pictures on the left. And the back chimney, the, the fell almost completely from the feller plane down um, a distance away, and it created like a crater in the ground about three feet in depth. Very dangerous. Across the street from this home, uh, we have seen pictures earlier about the industrial building. In this case, um, this building is located right across from this stone masonry home, and we saw some shear deformation at the top part of this building, and 
this seems to be a single ply sheet of steel, while the bottom part does not appear to have any uh, deformation. We believe this uh, is due to a change of stiffness because it seems to have been a double ply steel, resulting in a somewhat stiffer bottom section. So there are not many structures or residences close to the epicenter. Um, since it's a very rural area, as shown by the previous very pretty picture. So the closest house that we could get near to um, try to do some reconnaissance was the house with the chimney on the far right. And we saw some buckling um, in that chimney. We couldn't get close enough to identify any cracking, but they probably sustained some cracking in, through the mortar and some uh, falling um, um, falling objects inside the house. This is located really close to the epicenter um, as identified by the green dot. And there's another one um, in downtown Sparta that does the same similar. So we expect similar behavior closer to the epicenter as well. Uh, this seems to be more modern construction than the previous chimneys that we saw in downtown Sparta. And this is the last part I'm going to show. Um, uh, we're going to go back to close to the downtown Sparta, and we're going to focus on the area close to Main Street. And this green area is cemetery. So in the highest, the zone of the cemetery highlighted in yellow is the highest elevation, about 20 feet higher than the rest of the surrounding area. And it was very interesting what was observed here. So on September 1st, we noticed that all of these tomb tombstones have seemed to have rotated in the same direction. So you can see here, they rotated counterclockwise. <clears throat> and mostly, this, the level of rotation is higher at the highest elevation area highlighted in yellow in the previous slide. And there is less rotation as you walk away from this area indicating that there's some relationship as to the level of motion at the highest point and, and the lowest point with respect to the soil characteristics. This can also be an indicator <clears throat> of the azimuth of the motion or the direction of the motion with respect to the rupture at this location. As you can see here in the third picture uh, from the left, this one completely fell it may be due to uh, the, the stone not being level with the ground, but you can see the rotation very clearly on the far right with this column rotated kind of clockwise um, in the same um, direction that the rest of the tombstone. Uh, with that, uh, we conclude our presentation. Um, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much for your attention and the panel will be all the panels shown here will be available for discussion and Paolo will coordinate the questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, we have just a few minutes. We have plenty of questions. So I'll start right away. Um, the first question is from Tamara King. Uh, what are the uncertainties on main shock and aftershock location and depth? Um, is it possible that the uncertainty in the location and depth may place the epicenter onto default? I guess this question is for Arthur or Kevin. Um, so it was whether or not there's uncertainty with the epicenter of the fault and, and if it uh, may locate onto the, uh, or the epicenter of the, from the epicenter of whether it will locate to the fault, is that correct? Paolo? Correct. Yep. Yep. Um, immediately not, you know, don't know exactly how much the uncertainty within the epicenter, you know, the, the determination of the depths of the epicenter. Um, but from some of the, the structural, you know, projecting some of the faults of depth, um, you know, the, the low upper, the shallower surface, it does seem like there could be some, you know, a better connection with at least the little river fault being there. The deeper ones, they they don't seem to match up with the surface rupture. Um, and so for the, the deeper epicenters, um, you know, there's determined 
um, you know, they, they don't seem to match the, the you know, again, the surface rupture with the fault. Now let either Kevin or, or Paul also add anything else. Uh, yeah, I'll just weigh in very quickly. Um, it's very likely that all of those uh, uh, locations, hypocenters, will be relocated with more data. The problem is that we don't have a good velocity model for this part of the world. We use a very general velocity model in order to try to locate those earthquakes. Um, seismologists are currently working trying to get a better velocity model. And in fact, there was a quarry blast, a scheduled quarry blast on Monday of this week. And I know the um, UNC Chapel Hill seismologists actually put out some uh, geophones to try to record that. And hopefully with data like that, they'll get a better velocity model, a local velocity model for this area, which will help them uh, locate those uh, hypocenters better. And they very well may uh, define a fault plane better than they currently are. Okay, thank you. Um, another question moving on. Uh, what is the maximum potential earthquake that could occur in this tectonic setting? What is causing the present tectonic, um, sorry, regional stress regime? Um, is this an active source or there's residual stress field? Is there anything we can learn from uh, GPS data? This is from James Bila. Um, I, I can speculate on that. The, the earthquake that Rick Wooten talked about uh, in Charleston was a magnitude 7. Um, that was clearly on a different fault system than the faults that we're talking about today. But uh, if we're just talking about faults being activated in uh, the southeast U.S. Uh, with a stress field oriented like we've got, um, we, we certainly have to think about something close to a magnitude seven as being possible since there is a historical uh, earthquake of that. Um, some folks uh, at the University of Tennessee, Bob Hatcher and others, have trenched some faults in the East Tennessee seismic zone, and they think they can see individual events that may correspond to magnitude six or so uh, on those. So that may be uh, uh, large earthquakes that um, may be expected, but hard, certainly hard to predict. Okay, um, we have many questions. We have to wrap this up, so I'll, I'll uh, read just the last one and then we'll forward all of the questions to all of the panelists. So uh, there may be you know, some answer that happen uh, offline via email. The last question is from Je Jesse Hill for Kevin. How do you think the normal fault mechanism along the lower creek lineament fits into the regional stress state and the other reverse faults mentioned in your presentation? Uh, good question, Jesse. Uh, it, it, it doesn't fit. And so uh, the normal fault on that magnitude 3.8 quake on the west edge of that Laurel Creek lineament uh, would correspond to a maximum compressive stress that was vertical. And so it doesn't uh, fit well with the regional stress field. So I think that um, it, it's hard to explain, and I'll and I'll leave it at that. Uh, yeah, this this is Rick. I can chime in a little bit uh, relative to the the Mills Gap Fault Zone and how that might relate. Our interpretation of the the Mills Gap Fault Zone that it was transcensional, so it was more of an extensional uh, regime. So that doesn't necessarily fit all that well with the current stress field either. Okay, um, thank you so much, um, everyone. As I said, all of the questions will be forwarded to our panelists. So, uh, you know, any additional question, please, that you may have, please post them. Uh, we'll take care of them um, and then we'll circulate the questions to the panelists. Thank you so much, everyone. Just some uh, further communications, PDH information will be provided in a follow up email. Uh, you'll receive a post webinar survey, please complete it. Uh, you can learn and join, uh, you can learn about ERI and join at eri.org slash join. Uh, you'll uh, find out more about upcoming webinars if you subscribe to the Pulse, which is an email blast you'll receive every once in a while. And we wanted to thank 
uh, FEMA, US Department of Homeland Security for supporting uh, this webinar. Um, as I mentioned, if you want to join or learn more about ERI, go on eri.org slash join. I think this was the last slide. Uh, I wanted to personally thank all of the panelists on behalf of the Professional Development Committee. Uh, the co-chair of the committee, Mervyn Kowalski, uh, was instrumental of making this happen. So thank you so much, Mervyn. Uh, for co coordinating this effort. Uh, to all of the attendees, thank you so much for your attention and your insightful questions. Uh, you receive more uh, news from us, uh, from, you know, with emails in the next couple of days about PDH and other uh, additional information about the webinar. Thank you again, everyone, and see you soon.